Week 11, distribution and retailing. Now, the key to understanding the back end of marketing is to think about the American Marketing Association definition of marketing and how we talk about creation, communication, delivery, and exchange of offerings that have value. Now, creation is the high point that we focus on in product and pick into a little bit in price. Communication comes up in week 12. And here we talk about in week 11, the distribution and exchange, the idea of bringing about the value offer from point of production to point of purchase and maybe beyond into point of consumption. But fundamentally, the idea for most of us as consumers is that distribution is the only thing we have to worry about when we buy online. So the last mile, or, and all the other miles connecting to that last mile, are virtually invisible. Now periodically there are campaigns to highlight things like food miles and bring an emphasis to shop local, but they come from an environmental save the planet capacity rather than from a marketer's perspective of is this the optimum, is this the best practice for getting the best value for our customers. Now the thing about place distribution, so in the four piece of marketing it's place, in the four piece of marketing where it's price, product, promotion, distribution, it's often seen as the least glamorous. It's the section that people are going and then you distribute. It's also mission critical in the sense of it's got a very strong prevalence in the business to business side of marketing and it's very dependent on understanding consumer behavior. Even more so at the moment where we're using particularly at the retail distribution shop front end, we're using a lot of predictive models based on scanner data, on real live data from retailing outlets as to stock levels, demand levels, and we use those as predictive tools to know how to just maintain the just-in-time inventory and the very low to no stockpiling which has the consequence of when it works, it's invisible. When it doesn't work, it's really visible. The particular image here is taken from January. Now, in fairness, the 4th of January is when the logistics channels would have been at their absolute most strained under normal circumstances, let alone 2020 circumstances. But the key is, all the time that the resources are in stock, you don't notice the distribution channel. As soon as they're out of stock, distribution becomes foremost in the mind. So the other thing to understand about the importance of distribution inside the marketing mix is it's not just the logistics of production point A to consumer point C, it's how it interweaves with a bunch of other theoretical frameworks. The packaging around a product. Now this is somewhere where the Amazon Corporation has absolutely nailed packaging to the point that they will ship you huge volumes of empty air if that's what the size of the box is needed to optimize the back of their shipping truck. So their packaging and Packaging links back to the augmented product, it links back to branding, it links back to the overall total value concept. You pick up an object, you look at it, you look at it in terms of did it get the goods here undamaged? Did it also provide something useful in terms of all the objects you needed in the one box or does it convey a brand? Does it convey a message? The next place where distribution links back is when we dealt with the services product. Distribution is functionally embodied through the service scape. 
but it's also embodied through a couple of conceptual ideas of do we bring the product to the customer or the customer to the product. We pick up price. Now for many of us, the most common interaction with distribution where it's very obvious to us is when we start going online shopping and your shipping component of the total price is equal to or greater than the cost of the goods themselves. And we've all had the moment where the $5 t-shirt is $50 worth of shipping and it's just not worth it. But also when we go back into price, in price we talked about the idea of distribution becoming the to influencing the total pricing concept. To add into that is the idea of the total pricing concept and when we talked about non-financial non price and time, that distribution where it's going to be, I buy it now but it will ship to me in a couple of weeks time, increases the cost of a product by the time to consumption cost. In terms of crossover with consumer behavior, purchase choice. Now this is also when we think about the consumer behavior decision process of evoke sets and the alternate choices. So as a consumer, you can have your primary preference, go to the store, there's an out of stock error, and you purchase from the second, third, or fourth choice in your inventory of possible choices. So logistics and fulfillment are necessary to enable the value offer to be at the point where the customer or the consumer wants it. Similarly, when we start looking at things like international marketing, we start looking at the logistics around distribution. In fact, a lot of international marketing is just the distribution networks. Uh, even if we're asking questions like whether we run a franchise, the distribution of an idea, the proxy delivery of an idea and concept versus an export where it's all distribution. Similarly, things like uh, positioning strategies also come into distribution where we start looking at it in terms of distribution as shop frontage. Even within the store, where is the product and positioning strategy began its life as the literal, what is the product to the left, right, up, and below? What does that say about my product based on where it is in the store and what's either side of it? Finally, the pairing of stakeholders uh, in strategy and business to business, where we start a little bit later in the chapter looking at the influence of stakeholders in the distribution. So let's talk about marketing channels to start with. This is where, by the way, one of the most ridiculous things in marketing is the argument over whether this is a three-level or a four-level model. We will argue over anything. If it's a three-level model, you're counting the arrows. One, one level, two level, three level. If it's a four level model, you're counting the circles. It's literally all the division is. Fur arrows versus boxes. But what this presents as a diagram is the idea of direct and indirect as strategic choice. Manufacturer to consumer direct comes with strategic benefit and strategic challenge. Quite often though, in business to business, you might find yourself as the direct channel, particularly if you are a consultant, cold calling, cold selling, you're trying to set up your own firm, trying to set up your own organization. You are, if you are the manufacturer going to the retailer, then that one channel, you'll note, you keep having that first channel. So direct channel, direct channel to customer, the idea of your invoking of supporting mechanisms. A retailer allows you to distribute to many more platform points than you can reach directly. A wholesaler allows you to reach more reseller, retailers, resellers. So you end up having some choices. Each step in the chain obviously invokes costs. 
as you invoke a cost, it will be either out of your profit margin or picked up and embedded in terms of the total price for the customer. So yes, whilst you'll hear people announce, buy Manufacturer Direct, our prices can't be beaten. It's like, we're aware of that because you don't have their costs. It may not be convenient to actually service a customer who comes to the shop front or comes to the factory front. It may be more convenient to have retailers and wholesalers so that your purchase through the intermediaries, they handle all the things. You send them a 1,000 unit. 1,000 units of Pepsi Max cans show up at the wholesaler. They get broken up to the retailers. The retailers sell them to the customers. Very few customers would probably need a thousand cans of Pepsi Max immediately directly to them. Very few. Now, the idea as well, if we start going back to the AMA definition, is we talk about the notion of marketing as a value generating activity. So marketing as a set of activities, but also marketing as a set of institutions. The AMA's idea of the partner comes into play here when we start looking at this notion of manufacturer to wholesaler to retailer to customer. The three people in the supply line here are partners and their value creation is codependent. So there's opportunities. This also brings it back the stakeholders and the stakeholder theory. And some of the stakeholder stuff uh, in the supply channel and the distribution channel is particularly, uh, it's particularly well researched because it's of interest to a lot of people. But also there's this notion that the manufacturer, the actions of the manufacturer can impact the customer directly. For instance, if you end up with a product uh, boycott because of how the manufacturer is making, where they're sourcing their parts from, where they support, you know, a company has claimed that they don't test on animals and you get down to the customers finding out that actually yes they do, or the retailers, uh, so if you're looking at somewhere like the Body Shop or Lush, and they say not tested on animals, it's like the retailer didn't test on animals, so they're strictly truthfully right. You go back up to the wholesaler. The wholesaler didn't test on animals. You two for two. Then you get back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer who made the products didn't test the final product on an animal. Then you find out the manufacturer sourced a whole bunch of materials because your chain keeps going further and further up, back past off the top of the screen. And somewhere in the raw component parts, animal testing was involved. The consumer isn't going to go, well, eight of, the seven, eight of the nine parts of the chain were okay. They'll go, you tested on animals. So the partners all interplay and interconnect and have an impact on each other. They also have an influence on each other. Uh, one of the things about reading an Americanized textbook is you get to see the words Walmart on a regular basis. And frankly, as a, an entity, Walmart is terrifying because it holds too much power as a stakeholder. But if we want to briefly talk about stakeholder power inside the supply chain. Inside distribution, now the most obvious form of stakeholder power is the ability to administer a reward. Cash, power, proxy power, access to markets, positive benefits rather than, and this is always an interesting challenge, a reward functionally is a punishment yeah, hear me out, a punishment that is administered to others if you're treating it like, if you get plus 10 and nobody else gets plus 10, there is an argument to say that in fact the people, the other people in the room lost out. But a reward basically, we're very familiar with this concept of it's a positive benefit for that particular partner. The co-creation stakeholder is the idea that in order to make the mutual gain, both parties need to be involved in the collaboration. And we have quite a few co-creation based 
uh, distribution networks where the supply line comes together and the additions of value down the line create the end product that's of value. So particularly if we're looking at something like uh, a retail, actually we're looking at a restaurant outlet, uh, River Cottage, it's in the United Kingdom. The emphasis on their supply chain management where they're using locally sourced, organic, freshly grown, those products become super valuable because they also are co-created, co-creating the value, their suppliers are providing good quality materials, and the end creation through uh, Hugh, Fernley, Hugh Fernley Whittington's restaurant chain where this guy's an expert chef and has expertise in the use of the local materials, creates the value. So the value wouldn't work is if you had these wonderful uh, fresh fruit and vegetables cooked badly or administered poorly. So the next on the, the step here, the referent power. Now this is a really interesting idea. This is the idea that affiliation with the supply chain gives you credibility. Effectively, uh, if we think about independent artists, uh, either as musicians or professional wrestlers, signing with a major label or signing with a major federation shows that you are someone serious, that you've got a reputation, you gain this referent power of being attached to a much bigger, stronger, better known entity. The next step from referent power is the idea of expertise power. Now we use expertise power a whole lot and it's a really valuable part of the supply chain. For example, in Kickstarter, so Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform. They are a distribution channel who has an expertise and their expertise is in the brokerage of acquiring a knowledge base of users who then are managed through Kickstarter whose pledges are managed and processed through Kickstarter, and Kickstarter can focus on expertise in financing, brokering, and dealing with the administrative back end of finance, so that they Kickstarter collects 20,000 individual payments and presents a single check to the user of Kickstarter, the person whose account was, or the person whose product's just been crowdfunded. Their expertise then creates value in that chain. So there's a lot of expertise driven stakeholder power where knowing how to do something better than the person who's come to you to partner gives you the power. And there's a lot of value to be made here. So this is also for those of you looking for a career in consulting, expertise power is good power to be exerting. Similarly, there's information or data uh, stakeholder power. It's where you've got access to a market space. You've got the, now, this can be market research, but quite often it's the, we look at something like a Facebook or Google or the big, big chunky entities that know a huge amount of information about a lot of stuff. But also, if you've got access to observational data, if you've got access to market research data, if you've got key knowledge in an area, then you've got stakeholder power through leveraging that information. And the final one on this, it's here because it's got to be here, but it's not a marketing way of doing business. It's not a market, because literally, the moment you use a coercive, penalty-based, force-based approach, you breach exchange theory and you stop being a marketing activity. We are quite literal on this, is you can use a bunch of marketing techniques for coercion, you just can't call it marketing because it breaches the opportunity to reject. So you gotta watch for that one. Um, also, if you find yourself in a coercive stakeholder power relationship, get out. Lawyer up and get out. Now, Information supply lines, um, this is one of the things I want to talk about, two concepts sound quite the same, 
The marketplace. This is the physical location for the transaction. The market space is the data layer that lies over the top of the transaction network. So if you think about a single purchase, you've walked into the Canberra Centre, you've walked into the Coles, you've picked up a single product, you've gone to the self-service machine, swiped it through, swiped your Flybys card, tapped your credit card, walked out with the product. For you, that was marketplace. Inside that market space, the first piece of data is we have the inventory, stock decline, stock object has been purchased, real time track. Second thing is your loyalty card has notified the store who you are, and it's notified a chunk of um, psychographic and geodemographic stuff about you as, depending on how much data is loaded on your card. One of the demographic uses of the market space that I've noticed Coles does a lot is the choice of soundtrack ties in to the assumed age of the shopper. Because I'm reasonably conversant with 80s, 90s music, and I know that there's a 10 year difference, and I can tell apart the 80s from the 90s, having been raised through both of them, I know when they're targeting the generation above me in the soundtrack versus because they're playing the music of my older brother's youth versus playing the music of my youth. So the loyalty card data helps you make some marketing decisions. So the market space data is really useful because the loyalty data says, okay, born in 73, therefore came of age around, uh, was leaving high school between 88 and 91, therefore top hit singles from that period is going to set off a nostalgia vibe, a friendliness vibe. So all this market space now becomes about the distribution of ideas, distribution of feelings and experiences based on the data that's present to try and create a service scape, a data-driven, evidence-driven service scape. And you just thought, you know, it was a bit lucky that you heard your favourite track in the store. Also, sorry about the magician's other hand moment of showing you what the wires and stuff looks like behind the scenes. <sighs> Strategic choices in distribution. Look, when this, when this slide was written, when this deck was created, we did not have, we had not had a run on pasta, rice, toilet paper, and reasoned decision making. Sure, we'd had a lot of fires and we'd burnt down a chunk of the country, but one of the weaknesses of the evidence-led, predictive, data-driven inventory approach is it's not designed to be flexible. It's crisis vulnerable by design. So large bulky goods don't get stockpiled in the first place. They get produced on a predictive cycle based on trends and patterns established over a number of years. Throw in a crisis event and the stockpile, the inventory, will fail under the conditions that have been established because it's not within the software's expectation. So just-in-time works quite well under certain conditions. Two of those conditions are free movement of trade. And this can be both the European Union and the Brexit deal in terms of open borders, quick transits, but also it can be the Australian context of you simply can't get the truck from Melbourne to Sydney because the road's on fire or the road is flooded 
or the truck that was carrying the goods caught fire while stuck in a flood. And I'd just like to say that I have had a shipment of goods delayed one time because the truck it was on got stuck in floodwaters in a drought affected community. So just in time when it works means that the manufacturer knows roughly how many units to produce so that most of the inventory is in fact stored in motion. So instead of it being a warehouse somewhere in outer, the outer suburbs of Melbourne having a giant stockpile of uncooked pasta, the pasta manufacturers are like, okay, we're expecting 20 million units to move, we'll make 20 million units. If there's suddenly a run on demand and there's a need for 60 million units, they're not gonna spiral up. They're not going to suddenly have the opportunity to respond because that demand is only going to get detected after the event. And also some of the just-in-time systems won't pick a fluctuating demand because as soon as the product's sold out, then the customer's moving to alternates. Which is why pasta sold out first, then rice sold out. And you probably find there's going to be one heck of a good run on other expandable, water-soluble food. But we also then run some missing options here. In distribution, in inventory, does the value offer need to be immediately accessible? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, if you need it to be immediately available, you have to stockpile it. Stockpile it means redundancy. It means overpurchase. It means it may be that if you didn't pick your crisis correctly, or your peak, and you've got excess stock, then that stock is costing you money by being in the warehouse that you have to rent to hold the materials. The second question is around buyer, is the buyer willing to wait for shipment? Can we do automated restocking? This is where the systems are currently finding interesting challenges because an automated restock signal is predicated on the idea that the materials can be restocked. And one of the things that um, retail stores have had a propensity to do is that if a product sells out faster than it can be restocked, they will drop that product line because it's creating gaps on the shelves, giving the perception of supply problems. So whilst it sells out quickly, they won't stock it because it's harming the overall image of the brand. I can't see retailers dropping uh, toilet paper as an item category, but I can see them doing, ma I can see the automation come in where it's either pre-order or home delivery only. Now if you shifted to online only, home delivery only for the sales of high peak demand material, you could do pre-orders and notification of in-stock. The other thing about the just-in-time production is that it's been an ongoing and long, long history. There's been a lot of work around it, but it does require, it works really well with the um, principle of relationship marketing. And relationship marketing is predicated on the idea that you think about more than just the initial transaction or the immediate transaction. You uh, assume and project for a longer term engagement over multiple transactions over a longer period of time. It also is predicated on three functional foundational ideas and these are trust, commitment and reciprocity. Now trust in marketing is a much more complicated beast but it comes down to are you willing and able to depend on the other party to the transaction? There are about a dozen different forms of trust. There's calculative trust which is, it's worth more to me to trust you than it is to betray you. There is emotive trust, you've always been there for me. So there are different ways that you can think of trust. One thing about marketing is that we do actually have a mathematical equation for 
the point in time it's in your best interest, it's optimized to act in an untrustworthy manner to your business partner. And this is where your ethics goes off, ringing a bell, because yes, we have a calculative trust model. The second facet of relationship marketing that's important is the idea of commitment. Now commitment says that you're willing to take some hits on the transactions because over the long term and life of the relationship, it's of mutual benefit to both of you. Commitment also means that you'll do things like, if you're going to go for a distribution co-creation arrangement where you benefit and your supply partner and your retail partner benefits, you need there to be a commitment to doing this for long enough to make return on investment, for economies of scale to work. And this is where things like uh, where Apple creates a, long, a commitment with their suppliers to use screens of a certain size. It's worth then investing in the glass cutting and the glass manufacturing because you know you've got three to five years. If they were a bit flighty about it, then it wouldn't be worth doing and they'd struggle to get supply and parts. Finally, on relationship marketing, reciprocity. Now, reciprocity is an interesting idea in that you don't have to have equal exchange on every transaction in every part of the relationship. You can, you work to the assumption that over the long haul, over the life of the relationship, value for value will be exchanged. And it's okay if it doesn't match each time, it'll even out on average. So trust is, I can rely on you, and I will rely on you, and you can rely on me. Commitment is we're going to do this and partner together and be dependent upon each other because we trust each other. And reciprocity is that trust and commitment will bring us benefit. Sometimes it will bring you more benefit than me. Sometimes it will bring me more benefit than you. But in the long term and the long run, it's of value to both of us to maintain the trust to trust each other and to maintain the commitment. Now, a couple of the other crossover things I just want to draw your attention to. I mentioned a couple of these a little bit earlier, but just to highlight again, distribution is influenced by product. So one of the packaging questions is, how do you get this to the customer? So if your product is spiky or fragile or awkward to ship, then your packaging should be making it easier to ship. The notion of packaging, yeah, we take the old uh, Red Bull four pack here, one can's gonna roll around the place, four cans, this is gonna go wrong, isn't it? Four cans in a wrapper, stack up together, suddenly become a bit of an oversized Lego experience, stack it, pack it, rack it together, these become easier to distribute. It's also worth noting that the actual can object itself is two-way tailored, one-way tailored to the customer, but also tailored to work inside a vending machine, which is how we ended up with some standardized sizes and shapes that standardization allowed for distribution channel logistics. And this is where reciprocity the manufacturers of vending machines need to be able to trust the manufacturers of the cans that go in the vending machines. So trust, commitment, and reciprocity. Distribution is impacted by positioning strategy, and this is leading. This leads into retailing, where a strategy that supports the brand supports the positioning. So if you set your pricing to luxury, you've got a high quality exotic product, your distribution needs to match by making it hard to find. So the finding, the hunt, the pursuit is, in and of, is of itself of value. Similarly, this is why we raise the question of does the value go to the customer or does the customer come to the value offer? Bigger question services, quite a question now in terms of home delivery, last mile, Amazon's really pushed the idea of value goes to the consumer. 
your big brand, big box events like Walmart and Costco say consumer comes to value. And lastly, the uh, location of the value offer as a source of value. This is where you've got exclusivity, uh, you go into a store because there's a service scape experience. Uh, everyone who's ever walked into a Lush knows that service scape experience of the air changing color, flavor, and texture. As you sort of swim your way down to the giant pieces of soap that look like cheeses, feeling your lungs just fill with joy and glitter, it's a service scape experience. It is of itself of value in the production process. Uh, so it's worth, again, all these aspects sit inside your question around how does the value offer get created? How does the offering of value emerge from the crossover between all the elements of the marketing mix? All right, and having raised a couple of things about the service scape, let's talk about retailing. There are two aspects to retailing to consider. On the front end is the business to consumer side where customers go into the store. It's a service experience of selling fiscal goods. So this is why there's a spectrum and a continuum between purely physical, purely service, because there's a nice lot of crossover in the middle. But Central to the ideas of a retail outlet is the idea of applied business to business practice, which is also distribution and logistics, which is why the two chapters are back to back. Because you need to be able to put the value offer in the shop front in order for the customer to access it. At the same time, you want the customer to want to access your store and purchase your goods, and you have a set of logistics in there around point of sales, personal selling, service delivery, the store service scape. So it's a nice solid hybrid crossover. As an aside, in marketing, the very first marketing academic journal to be published was the Journal of Retailing. The Academy, the American Association of Marketing emerged from a retailing association back in 1935. So retailing's almost older than marketing in many respects. Now the role of retail, its point, purpose, and operation is to add value to the products and to facilitate the transaction. It's the value addition that gets really interesting here, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for marketers to use services marketing, new service product design, as a means to augment the sale of tangible physical objects. So you look into things, retailing, things like the logistics of location. Where is your store located? How easy is it for, does it rely on walking traffic? Does it rely on exclusivity? Canberra has hosted a number of speakeasy underground bars that the only telltale giveaway that you're at the right place is the government mandated maximum occupancy piece of paper stuck to the front door. But when you create these, you, know, you can use location to create value. Now if you're selling an adventure store, a venture supply store that you have to climb up to get into, if you're selling a goth clothing store where you need a UV light to find the price tag, if you're, all of these things allow you to add some value through the location. The second useful place in which to do value addition is obviously through the skill and expertise of staff members. Which is why if you're in retailing, pay your staff well, get good staff and get them onto contracts, long-term contracts, give them sick leave, give them decent wages, holiday time, because they're at, if nothing else, I'll just ignore being a good person for a minute, they are assets that make you the money. You don't go around the place. If you're driving a taxi, you don't smash the headlights on your ride. If you're driving an Uber, you don't go and try and put it in the ditch rather than park it safely. Treat your staff with respect, 
treat your staff with quality conduct, reward them, pay them, look after them, because they are the interface that gets the job done. So if you don't have your staff on board, if you're not looking after your staff, you're not going to have your retail survive. See every restaurant in Australia that's ripped the wages off the staff and suddenly gone face down into the dirt. Got to look after your people. That's your priority number one, look after your people. Priority two, look after your store. Priority three is ensure that your store and your people coexist well so your customers want to be there and want to give you money. Other aspects to the role of retail is there's an the experiential shopping, it's not so controversial these days, but when it first started, the idea that you would create these flagship experiences, it was big in London, it's still big in London. Uh, Melbourne has a few of them. The stores are way more about embodying and living the brand than they are actually about moving stuff off the shelf because there are many different channels by which you can get the product. So you walk into a Nike concept store and you know they've got a sprinting track, they've got a small gym. You could functionally you know, live there, work out there type of arrangement. IKEA borders on the experiential shopping. Let's test drive a living room. Uh, so this whole way through this, you're looking at, well, what's the value add? What does it do to increase the customer's experience, improve the customer's experience so that the customer wants to give you money. They want to give, create the exchange because it's been valuable. And the last aspect of retail is retail is your co-creation opportunity. And one of the places that absolutely smashes this out of the park is the Warhammer store. Now if you haven't seen this, this is the fantasy gaming store where you can go in, you can buy the product, buy the paint to, that you paint your little action dollies, action minifigures with, and you can paint them in store. And then you can play the game that you play with these figures in the shop. So you can go into the shop to play the game and buy all the parts you need and then buy all the upgrades you need and do and commit the upgrades whilst you're in the venue. I mean, it's brilliant. It is. I mean, chess would just absolutely be the way to do this. We don't actually have anything equivalent to it in the Lego franchise, which is surprising. You can go into a Lego store, and Lego has a strong um, child-oriented experience scape. And you can tell the experience scape because of the height of the tables. The small child goes in with the family, and they make their little model and they create their little model, they can't buy out the model then and there. They can't take that object that they've created, pay cash for it and walk with it, which is a missed opportunity. Because that big sea of Lego, lots of different options, you make your thing, you pay your money for your object you've just built, co-creation. So you've got to think about the uh, possibilities there, that there are many different ways in which we could do this. We could create, we can use our retail to enhance, but also to create additional product lines. So the other thing I've mentioned a few times, the retailing and positioning strategy. Just like to point out the literal positioning here of products. Some interesting stuff around eye level to hand level about uh, positions of particular brands. But basically, the two, two strategic, one tactical. Strategy one, is the customer going to associate your product brand as the type of product that would be for sale at this retail outlet? So there needs to be congruity between the retail brand and what the retail brand stocks. Within the store, where do you want to be located? Do you want to be, now it's really interesting, like I can break down this uh, particular fridge photo here, 
because somebody's pulled a very expensive positioning strategy to get the fresh fruit. And you're looking at the produce here, right next to the snack drinks. So this benefits the drinks being sold here. Now you can see you've got orange various juices being sold down the bottom here, uh, alongside fresh fruit and vegetables. So the processed material is down here. Purchase, purchase. So you're being able, your brain's drawing assumptions and associations between the fresh goods here and the processed material here. So that's getting a positive halo effect of, oh, I should eat healthy, I'll buy this and I'll buy something off the rack here. The cheaper spaces in a retail uh, positioning, those are the most expensive. Eye level is the most expensive. Hand level, straight hand reach level is next most expensive. So you might often see a line of products at the hand level, which is the same brand as the ones at the eye level, so that you're looking at and you reach out and you grab it. Or you might see a competitor try and buy out that space, so you're eyeing off the thing in front of you, but you're actually grabbing a different product. You think that's what you're about to buy, you grab something different, you get to the checkout and you're like, I don't remember picking this up. So your positioning strategies, again, uh, within the organization, within the firm, brands within a brand, and within the store, physically. Now note this is all stuff down in the freezer section. All of the things that you find at the end of an aisle, or in the middle of the aisle, or complementary goods bundles. So you walk through, and do this. Next time you go into Woolworths or Coles, walk down and look in the way, particularly, my favorite combination is, go to the corn chips section of a supermarket and look at the complementary products that are being sold alongside the corn chips, all the dips and all the other materials. Then head over to the Mexican food section, see what the, the two look like, and the complementary, the complementary product corn chips that are being sold as dinner food versus snack food. Look at the brands, look at the prices, look at the differences. All right, on the distribution strategy, I want to talk briefly to the idea that we're linking back some concepts. We've raised the idea in new product development around the innovation, around the different categories of innovators, early and late majority, early adopters and innovators, pricing strategies around prestige and price skimming. Well, they connect back to distribution strategies. So if you're looking at trying to reach an innovator market, now it's 2.5% of the audience, that they're into prestige pricing, then you want to use an exclusive retail distribution strategy so it's hard, challenging, but rewarding to acquire the product. In fact, you might often at this point in time use direct to manufacturer, manufacturer one level distribution so that you maintain an exclusivity of control and it's all about your brand. If you want the early adopters, again, you want to be playing selective. You want it to be in stores that suit their social communication needs, that suit their uh, role as influencers and communicators of new products. So the distribution needs to be narrower than in the widespread, but it needs to be slightly wider than exclusive. But also, it's likely to tie into the point in time where You've gone from manufacturer direct to you're starting to look into retailers. You, you may not be at the production process that you need a wholesaler, but you may be at the production process where you're making enough units that managing the sale of those units is starting to take away from your capacity to effectively deliver. So you start going, okay, now, it was all right for us to make and wholesale and retail and do all the logistics ourselves. We've picked up production enough that we probably need to start drawing some specialist skills. And then when you get to the top, the intensive strategy, that is as widespread as you can make it, but also using stakeholder, you think about the stakeholder network, it's using expertise. You're good at making the product, you're good at looking after the product's creation. You need to make multiple million copies of these things. So you've gone to manufacturers 
because they've got the expertise to implement your design at scale. Then you've gone from manufacturers to wholesalers to retailers because each of those brings an expertise in moving your value offer to your desired consumer. So your distribution strategies are often about how do I maximize the skills of the network that's available to me. So we also have a couple of uh, things around retailing and marketing. Uh, again, when we start thinking about things like the retail store as a product experience and how that ties in to the product, store positioning, experience-based retailing. Also, when we start looking at things like referent price within a store. So this is one of the things that's going to be quite a challenge is if your pricing doesn't match the store's pricing. You could play a role as the referent price to make everything else look cheap. You become the luxury item that only select few customers who go into that store buy. You are the $10,000 pen that sits in the front window for five years with people lusting after it because it's made of whatever it's made of, but you, never, you only need to move one of them to recoup all your costs on it, versus you know, referent pricing in the store, what's, as well as your positioning strategy for brand halo effect and brand rub off, what's the price to the left of you and what's the price to the right of you? Who, uh, is there a cheaper one here? Is there a cheaper one here? What's, what else is happening in that retail environment that communicates messages about your particular brand and your particular value offer? Same for uh, retailers in the role of place and distribution. Uh, they've got a whole lot of theories around things like retail clustering, retail miles. But one of the things it comes down to is that you'll notice in shopping, particularly when someone's laid out a shopping center, that you'll get little regions, little clusters of similar product offers clustering around the same geographic area in a store. And this has been proven to be quite effective because you're drawing in people with the same needs. So whilst it seems counterintuitive to be sitting beside your competitors, you're making the decision choice easier if your competitor can't meet the customer's needs, so you're all six stores are hunting for the same customers, you can offer variance, but you can also offer convenience of, oh hey, since we're here, we can look at these other five. Finally, promotion. Uh, when, we see, when we do the integrated marketing communications, you'll see that there are two promotional techniques, point of sale and personal selling, both exist within the retail shop front experience. So to recap, Distribution and retailing are so heavily cross-wired that we've treated them as a single entity. Uh, we've often split, we've split all the other chapters. This one has been wired together because it's wired together so beautifully. Most of you will have experience in retailing, some form either as a member of the staff of a retail operation or everyone's got experience in buying from retail. With distribution, it's the back end, it's the part that's usually invisible, but when it becomes visible, that's when things have gone wrong because you don't really want people to be paying attention to the wires and to the pipes and to the things behind the scenes. When it works, it works well and it's visible. When it doesn't work, people notice. But also, retailing has a role to make distribution a value add. So it becomes the offering that has value is both created through the distribution and distributed through the retail shop front.